I am going to be asking Christine some questions. She's really the expert on this. Um, my role is, as someone who kept the flame going a little bit over the years, I started at the museum in the late 70s and was aware of this piece and went down to U of C from time to time and look at it and, and also pull out a piece that's a sketch for it, so to speak, that will be in your show um, that uh, is a representation of, in, in a photographic form with some concrete on it, a representation of the whole project. And I would show that in shows and I would talk about the project, but it was really Christine and her team who, who brought this uh, to realization and we can look down at it right now and see it sitting out there. But before I ask Christine's questions um, to get our conversation going, and I, we hope to have a little bit of time at the end to, if you all have any questions to um, have your questions taken. I have pulled from our archive a memo from the desk of Jan van der Mark, who was our director at that time in, in when we opened. And by the way, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary next year too. So um, it joins the sort of 50 by 50 project. Um, so Jan van der Mark was our founding director when we opened in 1967, and he was friendly with Wolf and included him in many of our early projects, including our opening show. But um, what I have here is a memo from the desk of Jan van der Mark. Vostel concrete traffic, and this is handwritten, of course, in the, those days, people barely had typewriters, never mind um, word processing. And it says Vostel concrete traffic, and there's a wavy line under it, which is nice. And what it is, is an accounting of the budget. Artist per diem, $25 a day for eight days, $200. Purchase and towing of Caddy 1959, $105. Lumber and miscellaneous materials, obviously to make the mold, $250. Truck load, 10 square yards, concrete, $100. <laughs> Whoa. Um, services of welder, $85. Labor including anticipated January 15th, which I think would be the poor, the actual poor date, $1,200. Parking lot, rental, two spaces per month, $60. A grand total of $2,000. Temporarily covered by sale, obtained as a gift, so they got $2,000 donated. And there's a little note at the end that says, as soon as project is completed, for the sum of $2,000 has to be found for, from someone who is willing to take possession of car from the parking lot. <laughs> so with that, I want to dive right in. Oops. So Christine, how did this all get started? Your, your work on the sculpture and your, your interest in the sculpture itself. Use your mic. Oh, sorry. I started chairing um, the, our provost campus planning committee, um, faculty advisory committee in summer 2011, um, and was asked what my priorities might be, and besides you know, looking at projects that were coming through the committee anyway. And I had always been really interested in public sculpture, and I loved the public sculpture that we had on campus. And uh, so we started a conversation about that, and that seemed appropriate for this committee to take on. And uh, someone was saying, well, there's also a lot in storage. And so I asked what, and of course, the first work mentioned was, well, this car covered in concrete. And I said, well, is that a Wolf Fostel? And everyone stared at me saying, like, well, how would you know this artist? <laughs> now, I happen to be familiar with um, Fostel's um, concrete traffic twin sculpture, as I like to call it, which is a sculpture called Runde Verkehr, tra stationary traffic, that sits smack in the middle of Cologne. Um, on a median on a very, very busy street. And uh, that is an Opel Capitan um, cast in concrete. Um, and so that's how I knew. Um, and I happen to work on post-war European and German art, so um, I'm, I was a little familiar with his work. Um, so of course I said, well, I gotta see it. Um, and within, I think, a couple of weeks, I, would, I was out at Methods and Materials um, seeing the sculpture. 
And I still remember walking out um, and coming through that door, Roger, as I did so many times since then, and just being so exhilarated. I really felt like I had found this amazing artwork um, at my institution, at the University of Chicago, um, and was absolutely devastated at the same time um, because it was in bad shape. <laughs> and it was in a, in a way that was very visible. And interesting to me is that in some sense all the things that I felt were wrong, just instinctually, um, which is not how conservators and art historians usually work, proved to some degree actually to be problematic and, and were some of the problems. Um, there were these very visible patches. Um, they had been done with a compound that didn't match. Um, there was moss growing um, on the sculpture. There were cracks and the concrete was spalling. And there were these two I-beams that had been placed underneath to support the structure that raised the car way too high and had the tires kind of hanging down in ways that just took all the magic away from the sculpture. Um, so I was devastated because I I saw that the sculpture needed help, but also because I thought, if I don't do this, no one will do it. And I didn't know how to do this. Um, and in some ways, that's, the, that's why this day is so amazing. Somehow um, this happened, but it really became about um, putting together a team um, of just incredible people. Um, and certainly at this point, it's kind of a core, core team of 15 people, but many, many others who helped. Um, and so the first thing that I thought I would do was write a fan mail to my main collaborator, Christian Scheidemann, who's here, um, who is a conservator who specializes in working with non-traditional materials. And he was awesome. He said, I'll come out, you know, let's look at it together. And it kind of then started unrolling from there. Um, a lot of research, um, a lot of other team members, you know, we have a Cadillac specialist, we have a couple of structural engineers, um, concrete specialists um, that all came on board. So that, that's kind of how it got started. So when you arrived at U of C, you did not know that this was I there. I didn't know it was there, exactly. That's and then it was, placed in, it was placed in storage soon after I arrived. And, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, it, it was interesting to me because I knew it was there, obviously. And there had been some talk about maybe relocating it elsewhere. But I think it did just get put into to storage at that point when, you know, the Logan Center was being built. Yeah, I think there were some efforts to, um, collaborating with a CTA to get it yeah. near a CTA stop or something yeah, like I think, that. I think there was a little flurry of interest at that time. Um, but I think it's also quite fascinating to see it from above here and compare it with those Cadillacs there because it actually looks a little smaller than I recall it. When you're, when it's in place and you're looking at it at ground level, it, it does appear a little bit different. But I, I am just really struck by the fact that this is a big car, and it's so great to have actual Cadillacs there too. So especially younger people who may not remember our highways being clogged with these gigantic boats, you know, that took that that literally take up like three parking spaces if you have Mini Coopers these days. So. Um, I think the contextualizing here is brilliant, and congratulations to whosoever idea it was to, to bring actual Cadillacs here. Um, w when you saw the moss and the concrete crumbling, I mean, you said it was a terrible sight, but did you really feel like it could be brought back to some kind of semblance of its original form, and should it, should it be? I mean, was the whole idea of fluxes as something creating kind of temporary or ephemeral happenings, so to speak. Um, did it seem, were you torn a little bit? Like maybe we should just, the, should the, just the let this crumble? Being torn came soon thereafter, but I, I think that I didn't feel like it could happen, but I felt it had to happen. And I'm a little stubborn. Um, so once I decided that it had to happen, <laughs> um, and, and that really was, you know, it seemed because I knew the Cologne sculpture like something that should be preserved. But you're asking a really important question that actually became one of the most complicated questions in the project, and that I think is still, um, you know, should continue to get debated, um, especially if there's another conservation campaign um, at some point down the line, which is, you know, Fluxus was um, largely a performance-based movement. Um, artists often collaboratively staging um, happenings, interruptions amidst everyday life. And Fostel was being invited at the MCA to do precisely that. So he staged this performance of the making of the sculpture on this parking lot on Ontario Street, um, where the Arts Club is now located. And that was the artwork. Um, 
However, Faustel was also at this moment transitioning really, as became clear as I was looking more at Faustel, I had not really worked on him that much until then. Um, he was transitioning to making more permanent artworks at the same time, making sculptures, and I think was beginning to think about, you know, about 13 years, say, into his career, what would happen to some of the artifacts of his performances. He often kind of started taking artifacts and things that were part of the sort of um, environments that he created for his happenings and turned them into sculptures. He was beginning to think about that. And so he called it an event sculpture. Yeah. And that hybrid became really difficult to deal with in terms of conserving it. Yeah, it's interesting because I mentioned the, the work that we have. Well, we actually have two works in our collection that are very much along the Christo pattern of Christo makes these ephemeral works, but he raises money for it by making two-dimensional, often um, collectible items, uh, hybrid sort of sculpture paintings. And that's sort of what the, the Vostels we have in our collection are. They really, they're not documents of the piece. Um, they have elements of the piece. As I mentioned, they do have concrete in them, but it's, it's basically a photo. So he was already making these objects which were meant to be preserved. They're sort of quasi-documents, quasi-happenings, uh, because his stroke of the concrete across them is very important. But they also were both to you know, give to people as sort of mementos, because one of the pieces came from Jan van der Mark and his wife, um, was gifted to us. But also to sort of fund, fund his career, because after all, you do need to make a living. So yeah, he, he, there's a lot of hybridity to this and it's really exciting to see um, this thing preserved, I think. I think it's really wonderful. Those works are actually really important that are in the MCA's collection and we're borrowing both of them um, for the exhibition at the Smart Museum that opens, which is about Fostel's work with concrete from 69 to 73, so right around this time when he's starting to work with concrete. And uh, one of the things that is really great about those collages um, is that he, Fostel worked with photographs um, as we found out, or I should actually say, one of my PhD students found out, Solvay Nelson, and we were trying to figure out what he had worked on. There were these police officers officers, um, they were clearly street protests. Off, early on we thought they maybe were the DNC since he had made them in Chicago um, and nobody could figure out what they were and I showed them to Solveig um, who works on civil rights and art in the 1960s and 70s and she knew instantly that they were from Selma. Um, and so Fostel had worked with source imagery from the 1965 Selma protests um, and then uh, placed over one of the police cars the cement and they're absolutely gorgeous works. And one of the reasons why I think that they're interesting um, is because Fostel actually repeatedly in various books and contexts often declared basically political protests um, such as the Selma protests kind of artworks in themselves, so kind of very provocative gesture. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting because all our press releases at the time, the MCA's press releases, really talked about the concept of this piece being about traffic and, you know, traffic jams and, but I do see a huge political content in the work as, especially being from Europe where cars are much smaller and America being known as, you know, the place of the car culture, that it, it was a very kind of overt but maybe for some reason, the MCA didn't want to um, highlight that critique, political critique. And I think at that time also was the beginning of um, lots of urban destruction through tearing down neighborhoods to put through, you know, giant expressways. So there's definitely a, a huge political content to this piece that for some reason was not highlighted um, at the time it was made not by the MCA's publicity team anyway, and it did get a lot of publicity. Yeah. Although there's a positive side to it too, and that's actually one of the things that fascinates me about the sculpture and about Fostel, is that you know the concrete, um, this gesture of covering a Cadillac, um, I mean, it is a very negative, a very violent gesture in some sense, and yes, there's a, certainly a kind of critique of rising car culture, of urban renewal, of concrete kind of making cities all across the world, Europe and the US the same, and that's, again, echoes also in this coexistence of the sculpture in Cologne um, and here in Chicago. But at the same time, um, Fostel certainly also thought of um, concretifying objects like uh, this Cadillac as a kind of mummification and preserving these objects um, for the future, which I think is really, really interesting. Little did he know there are cat, uh, Cadillac clubs out there that preserve <laughs> these cars. Um, yeah, and I, I know, for, especially for younger art audiences, they maybe don't realize that 
basically saying the word Cadillac meant, you know, luxury, um, upper classes. Uh, there's a very famous film called the Solid Gold Cadillac, which was about a mobster. Um, it was a Judy Holiday movie, if you haven't seen it. Uh, so just the word Cadillac had a lot of potency in a way that it doesn't yeah. today. And I think so, it had especially for yeah, Fostel. So Fostel actually yeah. in the 70s drove a vintage Cadillac through Berlin where he then lived. Um, and that's, again, like this sort of ambivalence um, actually yeah. carries through in terms of how he thought about cars and about Cadillacs. So on the one hand, he produced a lot of work um, in the 1960s that was about Vietnam and yeah. um, you know part of many German artists being extremely critical um, of the Vietnam war and kind of equating that really with the US. But at the same time, Fostel so badly as a European artist, um, and at that point completely marginalized art market, everything had moved to the US, feeling really left behind and wanting so badly to make it in the US. Um, and so to get this invitation from the MCA was huge for a German artist. And likewise, driving a Cadillac through Berlin was a cool thing. You know, For that generation coming out of the war, Cadillacs and American vintage cars were in the kind of Cold War context. They were just, you know, they were a dream. They were the thing that everyone was striving for, while at the same time being extremely critical of the U.S. Yeah. And that, that kind of went together, you know. And I think that's one of the reasons why the piece remains so potently interesting. And I imagine you're going to be using it for teaching. Down Absolutely. There on That's campus. one of the reasons why I'm yeah. so excited about having it where it's going to be um, in the Campus North parking garage, just north of the Smart Museum and just north of um, Quack, as it's lovingly called, the Cork and Woods Art Center, which is where the art history um, building is located and where I teach. Is that we're going to be able to just walk out um, at any time and, and see it and look at it. And likewise, you know, everyone who's visiting campus, this is the main campus parking garage, everyone that's coming to the Smart Museum will be driving by and parking and stopping by to see it. That's fantastic. So do you have any stories of, uh, that you could tell us about that whole elaborate conservation procedure that, that went on <laughs> How for long five do you want to be here? <laughs> <laughs> So um, I guess maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, complicated decisions that we had to make. Um, so uh, let me, let's start with these patches that I mentioned. Um, very interesting in the sense that it became clear as we discovered historic photographs, the few that there are um, in the MCA archives, that these patches were there, these patches with this non-matching concrete compound. Um, that looked so wrong um, because there were no stones and it was much darker. Um, but it became clear that they had actually been done at the time. And Jan Vandermark actually kept writing to Fostel promising they were going to patch soon. So it was clear that Fostel knew about that. But we didn't know whether Fostel then actually en ever ended up seeing the sculpture with the patches, whether he had left any directions about how to patch. None of that we ever found. Um, so it was patched before it came to the University of Chicago, making these patches historic patches. Um, so while they looked wrong, that's not good enough to kind of say, OK, let's take them off and make it match, because we think that that's what should happen. So we spent a lot of time discussing um, uh, the, to what degree the sculpture seemed compromised in terms of what we knew about Fostel actually wanted out of the sculpture yeah. um, so and were hesitant I, to remove them. Yeah. Just to, to interrupt for just a second, Jan Vandermark actually left right around the time yeah. that the piece was going down to uh, U of C and it's really unclear if Fostel ever came back to Chicago. Exactly. Um, so then, though, really several years into the project, um, Christian Scheidemann found uh, documentation at the Museum Ludwig where they had kept documents related to Runda Verkehr, the stationary traffic sculpture that Fostel had directed later in life um, to match uh, with a compound that matched, uh, to, to patch with a compound that matched. Um, so at that point, we felt comfortable removing those historic patches. And then our amazing concrete conservator, Amanda Trinens, um, did lots of testing. Um, to actually get a matching compound, um, you know, with mixing rust into it, getting the color just right, sourcing stones that she was adding to the compound um, from the same quarry that they had sourced the stones from in 1970, all those kinds of wonderful things to get it just right. Um, so um, that, I think that that's, that has been a really, really great um, story. Do you know which quarry it was? Was it a local quarry? Who knows? Someone here knows. 
Because yeah. we had Robert Smithson do a local quarry piece around that time. It would time, be amazing so. if it's the same and, one. Yeah, <laughs> it's like pricked up my ears about that quarry. Yeah. So. And then I think another really difficult aspect, um, how are we with time, um, was the um, structure that ended up going underneath the sculpture. Um, so as I said, it was an event sculpture. So that made this, uh, this thing uh, very ambivalent in terms of what it was. On the one hand, if it were an event, if it were, was a performance, it meant that it actually, in some sense, was an artifact. And Flux's performances, they were lots of artifacts, flyers people would throw in the audience, et cetera, and we could kind of keep them, and you kind of take license conservation-wise to kind of preserve these. Um, but if they were artworks, um, you would be much more careful in terms of how you would intervene. And so um, it became clear that uh, our structural engineers, and really anyone that we talked to said, well, you have to support it. If you take these I-beams away, something has to be underneath us, or the whole thing's gonna collapse onto itself. But the historic photographs didn't really give us any information about what was underneath. And worse, the three people we talked to, David Katzer, who was the first curator at the MCA, Jim O'Hara, who was um, the art handler at the MCA and um, basically made the sculpture um, together with an assistant named Milan, who Milan is, I think, maybe here, um, who f filmed the whole lifting of the sculpture yesterday with his drone, which was fantastic. Um, so they all said there was nothing underneath. Our engineer said that, well, that's not possible. So that, that was a really difficult thing to then make a decision about. Um, so in the end, um, in order to bring it back, we had to support it because we, it was going to collapse. Um, so, um, but that meant that you know, we were intervening in a sculpture in a way that was something that was going to be very visible. Um, and so the way we negotiated this, you know, with an artifact, you would, might feel comfortable with that. With a sculpture, you might not. The, the, the decision was to make it as little visible as possible. Um, but it was going to be visible. Um, and so the structure that we have underneath there, I think we're all very, very happy with it. It will be visible, but to a very minimal degree. It's black, it's kind of set in. It will be in the parking garage. Um, so, so that was a challenge. Um, and then related to that, you know, once we had decided it was going in the parking garage, we thought, oh, that was gonna make it easy, great conservation-wise, because it was gonna be covered, no snow, no rain, no snow plowing, all these things we had worried about if it was gonna go in the street or outside. But this parking garage has a level underneath it, and it was never built to hold this monstrosity. <laughs> so we had to do more engineering to figure out how, whether the garage was gonna support it. And to avoid intensely cost-intensive shoring from underneath, our engineers, especially Chris Rocky, who's sitting here, um, had to do fairly complicated calculations and work with engineers with parking garage to have the sculpture hit just at the right points and to have the weight distributed equally um, to actually make sure that the garage was not gonna collapse. That's, that's amazing, and that evokes another famous artwork, um, the cloud gate, the bean, Anish Kapoor bean, which was relocated uh, to its current place. It was originally supposed to be over on Monroe, because it's over a parking garage and it wasn't gonna be able to be supported where it was, that's so fascinating. Are you worried about algae or moss still growing on the piece though? Um, we're gonna coat it um, so that graffiti, anything else will be more easy to remove than it was before. Um, I think it probably um, will not be as bad as it was. I mean, after all, you know, it had really never been treated in yeah. um, 40 years, so it, it should be okay. So um, I'll open the audience, uh, the to questions, but I have, I have one other question still. Um, I read somewhere that this piece, while it was parked at the parking lot, gathered a bunch of parking tickets. Is that apocryphal? Because there's nowhere you would put parking tickets. It's, no in, windshield the, it's wipers. in the papers, but that's, that's about all of yeah, the evidence I, that we found. I, I mean, I mean the, you know, maybe in the old days they gave parking tickets to cars in parking lots, but I they don't imagine what the MCA. I mean, I think that yeah. at some point someone was telling me the MCA had actually paid a fee yeah. to have well, the sculpture well, there. Yeah, I but mean, you know, this, before we open up the audience, in, this invoice does say that they paid sixty dollars to the parking lot exactly in order to yeah. be parked. Then before we Which open up like the audience, two, two days now, you know. Can you say just a few words, because I think this is one of the really important piece of the history of all of this, is Jan Vandermark was a big Fluxus fan. Um, and it was really because of his Fluxus interest and the fact that he even knew about these artists, um, who really weren't that well known at that point, that, that this came about. And, and the MCA is really important um, in terms of the history of Fluxus. Yes, I mean, the early years were mostly shows that Jan 
developed and help, David Katz have helped him curate them. But most of the artists were contacts that Jan had through you know, being from Europe. And uh, the very first show Wolf was in, it was a show called Pictures to be Read, Poems to be, Poetry to be Seen. And then he was also in the very famous Art by Telephone show, which was um, in 1969. Um, the, the first time that he was worked with just as an individual artist was in a show called Two Happenings Concepts, and that was um, done also with Alan Capro, and that show actually traveled. So Jan had immense uh, influence on bringing these artists over giving them opportunities and pairing them with American counterparts like Robert Smithson, who did that poor piece in a quarry for the Art by Telephone show, right? Where's Mary? Mary Richard, yeah. Um, so that, that was just his, his habitat, our first director's native habitat, was working with these type of very um, forward-looking artists. And it got him into a bit of trouble because he, he did leave um, sort of abruptly uh, in the mid-1970s. Mid um, but those early years are now looked back on as you know, prescient, really, because the type of art that these artists were doing, which was highly experimental, um, bringing together different media and different types of disciplines, and uh, being ephemeral, being performance-based or being um, very conceptual is really the, the way the art world has turned in recent decades. So it's it's quite a nice history I think we have. Um, Fluxus, just because of the way they were, it's always a little hard to pin it right down, which is as it should be, because these artists um, were a loose cooperative. It, it wasn't like a you know a, a, a group like the Harry Who or or some other artist group where they really form their own self identity. So it's just ripe for exploration. And we, I should just give a plug, we're doing a show of um, Merce Cunningham coming up in February called Common Time, where uh, his sort of contributions and influences from Fluxus and all the ideas of uh, individual artists working together in common time, each doing independent projects and, and supporting each other's creativity, which was very much the Fluxus model. Um, will be an, another way to kind of approach this, this group.